Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Strobe Talbot, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here to the Falk Auditorium at the Brookings Institution. Those of you who have come from the other side of the Atlantic, thank you for bringing the spring. Please leave it behind when you go home. This is um, a, uh, a particularly important event, and I want to say a couple of words uh, upon, about that. But we're very pleased that we have a number of very distinguished visitors and friends in the audience here, and I want to particularly point out that Ambassador Peter Wittig of Germany is here. He is a friend of many of us here at the Brookings Institution. Indeed, he's a friend of the institution itself. Brookings is delighted today to welcome and to host uh, Finance Minister Wolfgang Schäuble. His importance uh, in the German government, the importance of Germany's role in Europe and in the transatlantic community, is reflected, I think, by the representation of uh, three units here at the Brookings Institution and a number of our scholars. This event is being organized by our Center on the United States and Europe, our Global Economy and Development Program, and our Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy. And we're very pleased also that one of the leaders of our Board of Trustees, Glenn Hutchins, who has an association with the Center, has come down from New York uh, to be with us this afternoon. The minister's visit could hardly be more timely. Europe and the Atlantic community are confronting serious challenges, economic challenges, political challenges, and geopolitical challenges. I'm thinking, of course, of the rise in nationalism and Euroscepticism in Europe itself, Russian aggression, Islamist extremism, and, alas, the viability of the European project itself is now being questioned and, in some minds, in doubt. Germany obviously plays and has played and will continue to play an absolutely piv pivotal role in managing these problems. And Minister Sch Schäuble has for decades, in a series of high posts, been an indefatigable defender of European integration and transatlantic partnership. Following his opening remarks, he will be joined by David Wessel, the director of the Hutchins Center, and Kamal Dervish, the vice president and director of our Global Economy and Development Program. For those of you who tweet, it's hashtag Eurofuture. And Mr. Minister, we thank you for being with us, and we look forward to hearing your remarks. And after uh, there is a conversation here at the table, we'll, of course, open the conversation as long as time allows to include as many of you as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Strop, for your kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me to Brookings. I am happy to be here. I'm very honored. I can only touch uh, a few of the, of the many problems you just have raised because I am only finance minister and not for all the geopolitical uh, uh, problems uh, uh, responsible. Therefore, I will um, try to explain Europe once again. And today, I would like to explain why Europe sometimes moves a little slowly. But in the end, it's quite successful after all. You might think that our decision-making processes are cumbersome and complicated. And you might feel quite certain that Europe's current policies will lead to little or no growth. I could simply answer by telling you that the Eurozone's economy is growing again, and that this year every country in the Eurozone and the EU is expected to post-positive growth, but I want to raise a more fundamental question. <coughs> and this, how can advanced economies achieve growth today? 
they won't grow sustainably by talking um, on more debt and by pursuing ever more expansionary monetary policies. This is what has led the global economy into an unending cycle of credit booms and busts. Over the past quarter century, we saw a credit boom in Japan that burst after 1990. Then there was a credit boom in emerging Asian economies that collapsed in 1997. And after that, we had a credit boom in the advanced economies of the West that went bust starting in 2007. And at the beginning of each of these cycles, people said we were entering a new era of prosperity. But each of one ended in a crisis that incurred high and long-lasting costs. It became clear long ago that macroeconomic instruments no longer work the way they used to. And then we saw it uh, for the first time clearly when Japan tried to use monetary and fiscal policy as a way to create growth artificially. In my view, expansionary monetary policy and debt financed fiscal policy are not the solution. On the contrary, it con I consider them to be one of the main causes of the financial and debt crisis that have occurred in recent decades and of the weak growth that we are see seeing. In my view, economic policies to promote sustainable growth, which we are pursuing fairly consistently in Europe, will be more successful over the long term than economic policies that lead to cycles of boom and bust. One reason for this is that policies to promote sustainable growth pay more attention to the central roles that psychology plays in economic activity, particularly the importance of long-term expectations. Business owners, investors, and consumers expect policymakers to establish a stable policy, policy framework and to create long-term incentives for sustainable economic activity. Debt levels in the global economy continue to give cause for concern. Recent studies show that global debt now stands at $199 trillion. This is up $57 trillion since 2007 when the financial crisis started. Government debt alone has increased by $25 trillion since then. In China, debt has nearly quadrupled since 2007, from $7.4 trillion to $28.2 trillion today. China growth appears to be built on debt, driven by a real estate boom and shadow banks. Here in the United States, the debt ceiling will have to be raised again soon, probably no later than fall of this year. And we still remember, I do, the government shutdown that took place in October 2013. And an alarming amount of corporate debt is being issued by companies with a poor credit rating. Europe, too, is not being crushed by austerity. And I do not mention uh, what we call the uh, very specific role of the dollar for, uh, 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 for indebtedness, but, because, uh, uh, and, um, but even having this in mind, uh, Europe uh, is uh, in its limits not being crushed by austerity. Absolute debt in Europe is higher than before the crisis. And the debt to GDP ratio in the Eurozone is higher than ever. We have a deficit ceiling of 3% in Europe. So we are only trying to keep a cap on deficits in Europe and to achieve lower debt ratios. So the most important question for the euro area is, can we adhere to the rules which prescribe fiscal consolidation and structural reforms in the euro area? I think we can, and we have to, because of the special conditions of European governance. Here I mean the structure of the European Union and the currency union. You have to have in mind that the members of the euro area have transferred their monetary sovereign rights making powers to the European Central Bank. But still the member states dominate the fiscal and economic policy of the euro area. It's of utmost importance that such a construct of semi-sovereign states adheres to the rules they, give, they have given themselves to keep the common monetary and economic area intact. 
in fact, European government do just that since the beginning of the crisis. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but the direction is clear. We will succeed in overcoming our current challenges. Europe will continue to stand as a model of transnational governance that the world of the 21st century is so urgently looking for. By the way, if, if everyone else has a better model for transnational government, please tell me. I would be happy to take a closer look at it. Europe has a clear agenda with three main priorities. First, we intend to make sure that government spending grows more slowly than tax revenue. This generally, generally means that government spending must not grow faster than GDP does. This will enable us to reduce the debt-to-GDP ratio. Second, we will continue to implement structural reforms. The goal of these reforms must be to improve economic conditions and especially to boost the innovative capacity of European economies. That is why structural reforms are for. Reforms aren't just about making the labor market more flexible or ensuring the viability of social security systems. Rather, our reforms aim in particular to improve education and training and to improve institutional frameworks. By this, I mean link things like streamlining administration, ensuring an efficient judicial system, reducing bureaucracy, all of which are decisive for improving economic performance. And third, we are boosting investment wherever we can. We are setting up a new investment fund in Europe which aims to spur private investment of about 300 billion euros. We are also starting to build a capital market union in Europe which will open a new sources of financing for new innovative companies. We are adapting regulation in Europe in order to encourage insurance companies to invest more money in infrastructure. Government investment is also going up, including in Germany's, thanks to our success in consolidating the budget in recent years. We have been putting this agenda into action in Europe for quite a few years now, sometimes more successfully, sometimes less, but we are headed in the right direction. And the formula is working. The European countries have, that have already implemented real reforms are starting to see their efforts bear fruit. Countries that have successfully completed their assistance programs, that's Ireland, Spain, Portugal, are growing faster than, than other countries. Unemployment is starting to decline as well. In Europe, we have good reason not to provide financial assistance without demanding something in return. <laughs> And we do not provide help if a country doesn't use to it to help itself. A lot of people underestimate the problem of moral hazard. But if you separate decision-making power from accountability, and if you separate opportunity from risk, you can't succeed. That was the main cause of the financial crisis. And as long as the individual member states remain responsible for fiscal and economic policy in the EU, there can be no mutual liability in Europe. Even in the United States, which is just one country, the federal government does not assume liability for the debt owed by individual states. Providing debt relief and permanent transfers over and over again won't help a society to improve the long-term performance of its economy. And the monetary and social costs wouldn't be acceptable to the creditor countries anyway. Debt relief and permanent transfers wouldn't solve a single structural problem. They would weaken the incentives to carry out reforms. And they would create a problem of moral hazard in political terms, namely the experience and expectations that others will bear the cost of a country's own actions or failure to act. We in Europe must pay close attention to this problem of moral political hazard. We have to make sure that European solidarity does not weaken a country's motivation to take responsibility for what needs to be done. Europe is succeeding in changing itself. Sometimes this change comes slowly, but sometimes it came surprisingly fast. We saw this last year when we launched the European Banking Union, 
And now Europe has a single banking supervisor and a single mechanism for winding up troubled banks. But even when change doesn't come quickly, this doesn't mean that it has failed. In fact, it is usually successful. When we call for structural reforms in return for financial assistance, this isn't some narrow-minded mantra being repeated by people who have lost sight of the big strategic questions of the future. In fact, this well, may well be the most important long-term strategic question we face today. We in Europe will be able to cope effectively with today's global crisis only if our member states have strong economies and resilient societies. Since 2010, we in Europe have been working hard to fight our internal economic weaknesses. Yes, we face external challenges, but we face internal challenges as well. If we let ourselves become weaker internally, we won't be able to overcome the challenges from outside the EU. And we can't allow this to happen. The long term, the conflict with Putin's Russia will be, will be decided only on the basis of economic strength. Military power can stop an opponent, of course. We see this, and we are working together with you on this in Iraq and Syria in the fight against the Islamic State. And of course, we in Europe continue to, to depend on the United States for our security. But the conflict with Putin's Russia has features of a new systemic conflict, and it's a conflict that will be won by a state with greater soft power and economic strength. European sanctions are definitely having an impact on Putin's Russia. But we can afford these sanctions only because and as long as we have a strong economy. The conflict with Russia is also a conflict over what makes up power in the 21st century. Is it domination over territory and physical space that counts? This is what Putin's, Putin's Russia stands for. Or is it the power to shape global structures, networks, and the worldwide exchange of goods and ideas that counts? That is what the United States, Europe, and the shared project of the West stand for. In our joint efforts to ensure the success of the West, Europe can be an effective partner for the United States only if it retains a successful economy. That's what we are, why we are, what we are trying to do. But we are following our own formula, and we will succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Schäuble, for a very comprehensive and at the same time focused and relatively short speech, which is sometimes rare in this room, but <laughs> it's very good. Let me ask my, the, the first question a, a little bit on the spending issue. You said spending should not grow faster than GDP. You, you talked about government spending as a whole, but there as you know, there's a lot of debate, and I'm sure you've taken place in many of those debates, that spending that creates productive assets, and th these could be people in the, the digital age, it could include education, it could include infrastructure, actually creates assets in the public sector in the long run, or for the nation. And at a time when Germany can borrow long-term at negative real interest rates, and at a time when it has a $300 billion plus surplus probably in the balance of payments in the current account um, uh, probably this year, don't you, don't you see a much more important role for public investment in productive asset creation, which doesn't have to be physical. I mean, as I say, uh, you know, the right kind of education in the digital age is part of that. So in a way, isn't that a win-win situation for everybody? The public sector Im improves its long-term balance sheet. Germany's growth rate goes up. Germany's current account surplus goes down. And to some degree, not to a great degree, because there's a lot going on with the outside world, to some degree, it helps the whole Eurozone. In, in my view, the question is a little bit uh, too simple. I'll be very frank. 
even if you pay low interest or negative interest, I'm not very much in favor of uh, long-term negative interest rate to, pay, to be very uh, reluctant in, in this regard. But even if you pay low interest rate, you increase your debt. And sometimes you have to, to pay your debt. Otherwise, uh, you, will, you, you, you create, you create an, an increasing uh, fragility. And you know all over the world, that is what I try to mention shortly. Normally, I tend to speak longer, but uh, I said I would prefer to take a lot of time for Q&A. Uh, we have uh, one of the major problems of the world economy is the high level of indebtedness. If you take all the sovereign debt, household debt, companies debt, it's, and that is what has been said and what is shown for increasing concern to increase this indebtedness is not a, is not a, a really good solution. One uh, question, uh, answer number one. Quest, answer number two is, this morning I got uh, the economic outlook of the economic uh, uh, research institutions in Germany, which is a tradition in Germany, in spring and in, in fall, in autumn, uh, and they have said, yes, okay, we are, they ex, have raised up their growth expectation for this year, for the coming years. And they have given the recommendation not to increase our, expect, our expenditure, but to reduce our taxation. We have said we will spend in our government any euro we have additional available for increasing infrastructure investment. Because, of course, we have a lot of uh, uh, problems in infrastructure. Of course, I have, if I increase infrastructure investment, you know Germany is a federal, federal system. We have government level. We have, we have the federal government. We have state level. Uh, we have to have in mind, can the uh, construction uh, uh, industry deliver more? Or will we only raise prices? Therefore, we are, I think we have found a, a balanced way to increase uh, investment in infrastructure, roads, railways. But by the way, since Chancellor Merkel has become federal chancellor in uh, 2005, she has uh, very much relied on strengthening the part of federal budget, increasing the part of federal budget which is for research uh, and, uh, and education. And no government, never, has increased uh, the expenditure for research and education more than the uh, um, so different Merkel governments in 2005 has done. And even in, in this year, we have increased, you know, in, you, you personally know, you know Germany very well, uh, that uh, education is mostly to the state responsibility. But the federal spending for states to, in, to strength to support states to raise money for, ex for education has never ingre been increased in so, so high numbers than we did in the last couple of years, and even in this year. I could tell you the number, but it will not interest in Brookings in, in, in details. So having said this, um, I think um, the balanced way to say the, the problem is not only investment. The problem is in any member states, even in Germany. Look, I will always uh, have to be careful. That is my most challenging task for me because I always tend to be not so careful. Don't, don't try too hard. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I will always fail in my best uh, intention. Um, if, if I have mentioned institutional framework. A lot of economists all over the world are telling the most important thing are institutional framework. I could tell you in, in some European Eurozone member states the weakness of institutional framework as the main reason of uh, not uh, sufficient growth. Even in Germany, if you look at uh, how long it takes time until you get the admin administration license to maybe to build a new airport. Oh, dear. That's a, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's, 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 it's in, to be very frank, that's institutional framework. After German reunification, we got it. It's very difficult to get it in German, in, in German public opinion because of environment protection. There's a lot of reasons. Why you, oh, legal procedures and so on. After German reunification, 
we got an exemption from the normal judicial way for uh, for the licensing and uh, of of uh, the licensing of investments to be to be uh, brought, uh, Im implemented for only for infrastructure in the new so-called new Bundesländer, the former CDR. When we asked Parliament, especially the second chamber in Germany, what is not to be compared with the American Senate, but even more difficult for any government, uh, if that is possible, I, I don't know, uh, that we could use this good experience in general for Germany. Said, oh, no, 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 not at all. Yeah, Germany. Institutional further. In some other member states, it's very difficult to get uh, structural reforms in relation to labor market implemented. If, if you discuss with my French friends, whether it's Michel Sapin, whether it's Emmanuel Macron, they can tell you a long story how difficult it is in French uh, public opinion. And of course, the political parliamentary majorities to convince that structural reforms in labor market are needed. Spain did. Spain was, by the way, forced by the institutions, what we, call, what we used to call Troika, in the, in the, broika, in the program, that it was very successful. France would be happy if someone could <coughs> force the parliamentary, but it's democracy, it's difficult to get. As long as you give them way outs, you will never get the hard decisions you have to take. And that is what I call. You know, any democratic system, in my long, long experience, tends to take the more comfortable decision if you have the alternative to do so. And you have only take, uh, you will only get the <coughs> tough and long-term needed decision if you have no more comfortable alternative. Therefore, I am thinking we must give the right incentives. Let me follow up on that. Uh, Germany has a, a large current account surplus. Despite the investment program that you have outlined and despite your calls for higher wage increases, the IMF predicts that it will be 8.4 percent of GDP this year. Your output far exceeds your, the domestic spending. What responsibility what opportunity does Germany have to address that imbalance in ways that would benefit German consumers and workers and make Europe somewhat more balanced? And could, could I add one thing to this question? You know, the, the savings that are indirectly invested, German savings, are indirectly invested, you know, the, the surplus savings, about 25 percent in liquid assets, including with, including with the target balances at the central bank that bring the German saver a negative return. Yes. But um, our, our uh, current account surplus, there are two, uh, do we have to differentiate a little bit? Have we current account surplus inside the Eurozone? And do we have a current account surplus as the Eurozone as a whole? Because we are a monetary union. Until the last couple of months, when we have two very uh, specific reasons uh, uh, for, for current account surpluses, the fall down of the petrol, and of course the weakening of the exchange rate of the euro. <coughs> Since that we had, and the eurozone as a whole had a balanced current account. A balance, without a German surplus, we wouldn't have a deficit. We would have, the euro as a whole, would have been criticized in the, in the IMF frameworks, in the G20 frameworks, again and again as being a deficit uh, part of the economic system. Therefore, the German current account surplus has contributed to a balanced current account of the Eurozone as a whole, number one. Number two, our current account surplus has been reduced in the last couple of years until these two exceptional causes, which are, I think they are only timely. And uh, I never will comment uh, monetary decisions because in Germany it's a long tradition that we strongly support the independence of the central bank and that is even more needed in the European, in the system of the European 
monetary union, of course. But of course, it was to be foreseen, it was also foreset, if we would get by, even by monetary policy, not only by monetary policy, but not at, le not at least by monetary policy, decisions, a weakening of the euro exchange rate. Without any doubt, there will be an increasing of the German surplus. That is unavoidable. So, that is, but it's, it's only for, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's only timely, not, it's, it's not, it's not long, long term sustainable. Therefore, on the long term, we are reducing our current accounts. By the way, don't underestimate, we are spending a lot, a, a huge part of our current account surplus in foreign direct investment. We were one of the major in foreign direct investors. We are always asking for more foreign direct investment. Again and again, we are doing, we are delivering. And therefore, uh, we have in mind that uh, we have, I know, the, in, 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 in line with the rules of the European Stability and Growth Pact, since our current account surplus has been increased in the last couple of months, European Commission has taken uh, an, a procedure to, to, to examine what is going on. I've said that's in line with European rules. I'm fine with this. I, I accept it. But I'm quite optimistic we can say, okay, we didn't, there's nothing we have uh, manipulated. There's, uh, we, are, we are concerned. By the way, we have, we increased the wages in Germany much higher than the national uh, cost product is, and uh, the GDP is growing. We have the highest increase of real wages we, we used to have since decades, actually. The German finance minister has, by the way, already in 2011 publicly said Germany can enjoy and can uh, risk higher uh, increase of wages than other European member states. Therefore, we care on our responsibility, even in the dimension of, of surpluses. But please, don't underestimate, we have been, after the beginning of this new government, after general elections in late 2013, there was a lot of criticism, including the European Commission, including the IMF, that we have with some decisions, agreements in our coalition treaty, let's say, uh, some flexibility in the, in the pension age, Increasing pensions for, mother, for, for mothers. We have been too complacent, and we should care on our long term uh, or medium term competitiveness. And we should not be uh, too, uh, too, we have to have in mind that we to become complacent. We have said, okay, we can, we can, uh, we will have in, in mind, we will, think. but we have, even in Germany, we have to have in mind that we not, we have a strong position actually, but we, in the medium term, uh, the uh, competitiveness of Germany is not granted. We have to work for this. And last remark, if you ask my f European colleagues, would you prefer an economic weaker Germany with a lower uh, current account surplus? Oh, no. <laughs> and even in the IMF, we will get uh, Europe is growing on behalf of Germany as the driver for European growth as a whole. There were difficult to do everything right. <laughs> Speaking of difficult to do everything right, uh, yesterday you mentioned that despite all the headlines about Greece, that there had been very little contagion in the bond markets from the higher yields in Greek bond market to the periphery of Europe. Um, did you mean to suggest by that that Europe is now strong enough to lose a member from the Eurozone that can't do its homework? No. I have been asked, no, 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 I have been asked whether there would be a danger for a global economy. And of course, I've felt myself asked, do you, German finance minister, you German government, know your responsibility for Europe as a whole, for global stability, not only economically, but also and politically? Do you, do you have in mind this? And I would like to tell all the, audience and uh, please believe we know, we have in mind our responsibility, we don't care. I am quite sure I would, um, uh, we will, whatever will happen in, in, in Europe, we will not, 
uh, uh, takes the risk to uh, to uh, uh, endanger uh, the stability of the global economy, and we know, our, of course, our political responsibility. That was the very reason why I asked. Of course, we know you will have my, my Greek uh, uh, colleague uh, uh, this afternoon at, at Brooklyn as well. If, 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 if I, if fine, you know, uh, Yanis Varoufakis is a well-experienced uh, economist, uh, and uh, you can listen to him, what he's saying. Uh, we have um, ongoing uh, discussions because the, the, the program we agreed on, the second program we agreed on Greece has been uh, uh, ended, uh, uh, normally it, uh, it was uh, until to the end of 2014. We have uh, extended this program uh, twice, first time in fe February, now we have it extended late February and until the end of June. And Greece uh, is trying to get uh, the pending uh, uh, disbursement of this given program, which is together 1.8, 1.9 billion, 3.7 billion. But they can only get, on behalf of this memorandum of understanding, if uh, the three institutions can uh, give a report to the Eurogroup that Greece has Broadly, not 100%. We never ask for 100%. We are not as perfect as we uh, <laughs> sometimes have been told. No, by far not. Um, but these programs have always been, because the, 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 crucial, the, the key of these programs is that we, have to, we had to decided that we want to help any member state which lost access to financial markets. Uh, to, 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 to buy time in taking liability. We did it for Italy, uh, for, for Ireland, uh, Spain, Portugal, Cyprus, and for Greece. For Greece, it was the most difficult and the most, it was very difficult. We have, then we have drafted the program to have in mind how long will it take time until this member state concerned, in this case Greece, can get access to financial markets, full access. In the case of Greece, this was the year 2022. If you may ask Madame Lagarde what is in the line of the rules of the IMF, it was very difficult to get the approval of the IMF for this. We did it including a haircut of the private sector by 53%. Uh, of course, and financial step access to markets is defined on behalf of the souls. It's not my inventor, invention. 100 uh, public debt, not over 120 percent of GDP. That was to be achievable in 2020. Greek was delivering better than expected in the program. But of course, you need a primary surplus if you have a debt to GDP ratio by actually, let's say, 160, 170 percent, you have to leave, have a primary surplus to reduce it. That's quite clear. Without, and, and, and therefore, the Greek government, any Greek government, has to tell someone, what do, what do you think, when will you get access to financial markets? Because then, of course, if you don't have access to financial markets, you need someone who lend you money. So Europeans have said, okay, we, we are ready to do it until 2020. Suppose you will work that you 2020 can deliver. That is a bit disputed. That is what is on stake to, ne to be negotiated. If you find someone else, whether it's in Beijing or in Moscow or in Washington, D.C. or in New York, who, who, loan, who lend you money, okay, it's fine. We would be happy. We would be <laughs> not but I bet you will not, it's difficult to, to, to find someone who is uh, lending you in, in this situation amounts by 200 billion euros. In that time, it was much more than 200 billion dollars when we agreed on this. And therefore, it's not as simple as it has been said. And therefore, we are saying, please, if you don't deliver, we can't disperse, that is in the memoir, the last pending disbursement. It's not a matter, by the way, of the Greek debt. The Greek debt, the given Greek debt, it's a matter of the actual primary surplus. It's a matter of the actual competitiveness of Greece. It's a matter of Greek debt is a, is a question of which is, will be raised uh, 
long after 2020, because the Greek debt is financed for 30 years in general. And the interest rate, which is Greeks paying in average on its total debt, is seriously below the interest rate the German finance minister has to pay so the German uh, general debt. No, not to be. No. Therefore, restructuring of debt is not, in the, in the given situation, the, the, the most problem. The problem is regaining competitiveness to get a primary surplus. So what should we ask Minister Varoufakis when he comes here? Oh, no, I will not take you as agent because I have, look, I, as European finance ministers meet uh, so often. I, 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 meet my, I, I meet my, I met my European colleagues sometimes more often than my, my colleagues in my own government. I don't need any, <laughs> any intermediate. I have good contacts in I just thought I'd offer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But give him my best regard. I, I hope to see him in the days of uh, Washington in the IMF. Mr. Schäuble, one more question, I think, before we might turn to the audience. I mean, you are, I mean, I, you know, I've had the, the honor and the luck to follow your career for quite a while. You're a, you are a great European. You believe in Europe more, perhaps, than many, many others on the scene, in, in, in the European scene now. And I, I've, I've had, you know, one meeting with you where you, again, reaffirm that, that strong belief. And I also think that what Europe has achieved over the last decades is, is a fantastic achievement when, you rec you know, when one thinks of where it came from. But at the same time, it seems to somehow run out of steam. The p participation rates in, in European Parliament elections are disappointing and have been falling, <laughs> particularly disappointing in the new, mem new member countries. And uh, somehow the enthusiasm that you have, and you, have, and, you know, I, I, well, I'm not a member, but I also still have, <laughs> is 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 very fragile. You have a situation where uh, Marine Le Pen is close to 25 percent with a program of wanting to get out of the eurozone, with taking credits from Moscow. 25% uh, of a large European country is, is, is quite a, a figure. Uh, you have the fact that the Greek government still, I'm told, in the polls has 70% support of, of its electorate. Um, how, ca how can this monetary union, you know, the, you, you told us how, how the debate took place, but I have the feeling that most people may, I don't know, I don't want to speak for you, but y something has to happen for the monetary union to survive on the political sphere. And, and that has to do, in a way, with r Europe regaining some enthusiasm, some, some dynamic that, that gives confidence in the future. How, you do, how do you see that dilemma, as a great European that you are? Do we have another two hours? <laughs> Yeah, and that's, 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 a key, uh, that's a key question, but it's all, not only the question of Europe, it's also a question of all the Western uh, democracies and societies, to be very frank. If you look what's going on in the UK, not part of the Eurozone. Hmm? So, uh, if you, well, I could mention a lot of other <coughs> things. That sometimes, <laughs> that's my, first, I mean, not, um, uh, uh, try to not to answer your question in, in concrete, but I would I my, can only react with beginning with some general remarks. We have, uh, <laughs> I think it's in in the, in the in the in the substance of the human beings that whatever you have is not as worthy as you what you want to have. And since we have, we have, uh, we could wonderful uh, watch this uh, uh, in 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 the in this part of Germany, which used to be the GDR under Soviet Union uh, system, until 1990. In the first free democratic elections, the participation rate was by far above 90 percent. Since people are sure that they have the right to elect in free and not manipulated the democratic elections, participation is going down. Not only in European elections, by the way. 
I have said in Germany is a saying, oh yes, of course, it's on behalf of all these political parties. Don't bother. Terrible. Okay, let's take it. On local, on local, uh, in local communities, when we elect mayors, it's often the case, the case that mayors don't are not candidates for a party. You even don't know is, is this candidate member of a party or not. The participation rate in local elections of a mayor is below the participation rate of a European election. Therefore, it's not a problem only of Europe. It's a problem of people think democracy is granted. We must not care. That's wrong. Democracy without democracy is always a little bit risky. <laughs> but uh, therefore, it's, it's my first remark. Second remark is, uh, so far, it's, it's an overall, but what can we do? We have to care. We have to think about it. I think we have what we, <laughs> I, I ask, I'm asking again and again that we do it stop in an in a, in a, in a American, uh, in, a, in a Western uh, a, a common discussion. How do we, uh, we, how can we in this change of communication by the IT revolution? which is not really understood what it means for our society, for our democratic system, blah, 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 for the procedure of our communication. And we know, and democracy is uh, uh, had, uh, related with uh, communication. How can we find a path of way to, to make, to, 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 to set the modern communication system with modern technologies and this fast speed is fit with our Western values of democracy, rule of law. I'm quite sure that democracy will only work on the basis of a representative democracy. It doesn't with a uh, non-representative uh, that makes, uh, may, may work in the Switzerland, but not in a, in a greater sense. It doesn't work. Without representation, it, it, there's no democracy. We know it, and we have to find the, the link between uh, democracy uh, and uh, uh, the rule of law, and separation of, of power and all was the uh, uh, so relations between the different uh, uh, demo, uh, 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 legislation, executive power, also disputed even in U.S. By the way, if I follow what is written in medias in, in Germany on, on U.S. discussions, and not to mention the jurisdiction as well. Uh, but we democracy is not granted. But I am quite sure. Most people, not only in, in, in the Western world, but all over the world, are in f if they have to choose, they want to choose for our values. Therefore, it's our, it's our responsibility. Not to forget it's not granted, but it is worth it. Therefore, my third remark is, and then I come to Europe, I am quite optimistic. As soon as it is, as it is a little bit questioned, it becomes better. By the way, all the Eurosceptics movements in, in, in Europe has not been as successful as expected in last election, if, including France. If you look at the election on the, the level of department, it was the, the, the result it was too high for France and not by Spur, but it was not as high as expected. If you look at Finland, uh, in, 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 in Finland will be general elections on Sunday. What on the election? UKIP in UK doesn't play in the, in the general election. You may ask the George Osborne, he's, he's arriving in Washington DC this afternoon. Uh, it will not play the role it was expected one year ago. Even in Austria, if you remember, it was in late, <coughs> the late 19s when Haider, hmm? hmm? no, we are only concerned with the uh, with, uh, heritage of Haider in his bank. In, in, in <laughs> but uh, we must not care in, in the US, uh, by the way. <laughs> and so, so I'm, I'm not as pessimistic. I'm not as pessimistic. And, and as soon as it is questioned, therefore I'm saying the democratic, the, the world is moving in trial and error, um, to quote uh, Karl Popper. And it's, it's the advantage of a free society that it can learn it from errors. Dictators cannot be corrected. Then, having said, uh, coming to, to Europe, even in Europe, if, you, if European integration would be at stake, you will see huge majorities all over Europe to defend European integration. 
the European integration it's in, in, in the basis is not really disputed. Even the so-called Eurosceptics, uh, if you ask them, do you want, uh, the, the, are you not in favor of European integration? They say, oh, no, no, we are also in favor, but not, it's in the way it's, it's just done to actually, but not concrete, but in general, we are in favor. There is not many, there is no huge danger that we really fall back in nationalism in, in, in the part of Europe which is part of the European Union. We have the problem in Russia. Russia is uh, moving, the Putin government is relying on uh, provoking nationalist uh, sentiments, which is in the short term successful, in the long term not, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I'm quite optimistic. So, but then, then, then we have to care what are we doing in Europe? We are too bureaucratic. You can't understand how decision making works. That's true. Therefore, I am strongly in favor of the German government is in favor of treaty amendments. It's difficult to get, but someday we will get it. To make it more efficient, more transparent, to strengthen the European Parliament. By the way, we have achieved the progress. European Commission, not every member of head of state and government has liked it. I don't quote one, but um, you, you, may, you may have followed. But the, the role of the European Parliament has been strengthened after the last election. And this process, this interview is going on. And therefore, we have to, if you tell people whatever they agree, they, it's not worth it because they will not stick to what they have agreed. We're not like, even if the German finance minister, this stupid guy, is asking for to stick what has been agreed or to implement, it's to defending Europe to tell people, no, we can trust each other. So we have, we have, uh, Germany has by far, actually, the, the, big, the, the most advantage of, of the economic integration and of, uh, in Europe and of the monetary union. Therefore, it's quite clear, I, clear, I tell this to my fellow countrymen again and again and again, it's in our own interest to defend our European mon uh, currency and so forth, by sure. Therefore, we have to, Grant solidarity. Without solidarity, no community works. But solidarity is never a one-way procedure. It's a, it's a, 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 a double-way procedure, two-way procedure. Otherwise, it will not work. And therefore, you have, therefore, as long as we don't have institutions, we have we have to work for confidence that agreements or rules are taken, not more. Thank you. I think we have time for some questions. Uh, Bill Drozniak here, we'll start. Uh, please tell us who you are, wait for the mic, and remember questions end with a question mark. Uh, Bill Drozniak, uh, Brookings McClarty Associates. Air Minister, nice to see you again. I have a question about the uh, long-term competitiveness about the German economy. A lot of major German companies are saying they're leaving Germany um, because of the high costs of energy there. Some of them are stepping up their capital investment here in the United States, like Siemens, BASF. In your view, unless there's a radical change in the energy policy of your government, is there a risk that uh, there will be a hollowing out of Germany's industrial base? I know that energy is, is really a problem in Germany. That is not to be disputed. And for some energy, it's on behalf of the energy prices. It's difficult to stay in, in, uh, in, in Germany and to, to remain competitive. In it. That's true. But government does care. Uh, does care. Uh, I think we, we are moving in this direction. We have taken the decision that we, after the uh, disaster of Fukushima, we had uh, made a very short uh, 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 limited uh, change in our uh, nuclear energy policy. Actually, we have too much renewable energy. That is one of the reasons why energy is so, so expensive. It is not easy to be corrected, but it will correct. You will see, I think we will not in, see in the coming years a deindustrialization process in, in Germany. You must not believe any quarrel of uh, CEOs of, of uh, major companies. Uh, they have to take their interests. That's quite good. <laughs> uh, having said this, we care on the energy. Well, that is, uh, we have another problem. Not only Germany, but all Europeans are 
risk averse. One of the most disappointing news I get in my time of finance minister was in the beginning of, I think, 2011, that BASF, the major company all over the world in fruit uh, and, and, and plant technology, green technology, moved all its, not only research, but also production capa capacity from Europe, from Germany to US. Not on behalf of German regulations, but on behalf of European regulations. It was not, you know, that is one of the key problems in the negotiations on the TTIP issue. We have a different view on gene, gene, gene manipulated, or what the food. I am not the best expert on this. But that is also, we are risk averse. And of course, we have to discuss how can we link the needed innovation capacity to speed up innovation. If you look at um, the new techno technology, we all know that digitalization of economy is a must. We have the Hanover Mess in this week. It was opened on Sunday, last Sunday, by the Indus Prime Minister and Federal Chancellor. And of course, it's called Industry 4.0, what means digitalization of economy, industry. I think we have uh, taken this issue and we will be successful. And Chancellor Merkel is very, and her government is very engaged in this. But if it comes to data protection, you know the discussions. And <laughs> but that's what I meant we have, when I said we should start to discuss how we can uh, find a good uh, relation between the revolution in, in communication systems and our values. Because, of course, privacy and not to be manipulated without any limits and without any control. And who controls the, the data and so on? It's, it's a, a huge challenging problem, not only for Europe, also for US. I bet sometimes we are most normally, you have, US is far ahead in the development before Europe, and Europe is following. Sometimes we are ahead, and you, have, you will follow in some uh, discussion. I bet data protection is an increasing. And, uh, but, but Actually, we have the principle in European legislation, what is a little bit in my view strange, but now I have to ask German journalists to leave the room because I will create a lot of mess. <laughs> <laughs> to make it a little bit blunt, in, in, it's a, you, can see, you can have the, the feeling that in, Europe, in European legislation the principle is uh, in, in data collecting, what is not allowed is forbidden. I think this principle must be questioned because it's, if, I'm, if my reading of the history of freedom is that it is normally it's allowed what is not forbidden. If you make it the opposite, uh, you have to have in mind what will happen at the outcome. Mm. And you can see it's, it's not easy if you look really why we are, I think we speed up even in digitalization of areas. please. Wait and see. You have made a lot of people, the Anglo-Saxonians, including UK, have relied sometimes too much only on services, financial services and so on. We have <coughs> always tried to have um, a balanced way between real production and modernization and services and digitalization. So we, we will still compete. Eshwar Prasad. Short from Brookings. Mr. Scheible, let us assume for a moment that the Greek government does everything you want it to do, broadly speaking, uh, in terms of fiscal reforms, in terms of structural reforms. Yet there is a crushing debt burden that Greek faces of about 175% of GDP. So assuming that Greek do, Greece does everything you want it to do, do you see a viable path that Greece can survive and prosper within the Eurozone without a debt restructuring? And what would that path look like? Yeah, the answer is clearly yes. I do not want anything from Greece. But uh, Europe does want that everyone sticks to what has been agreed. That is called the Memorandum of Understanding, and that has to be uh, uh, discussed, as I just mentioned, by the three institutions, and they tell us blah, blah, blah. So, and the Greek program, including this 
debt to GDP, actually, what have you said? I, I don't know the actual number precisely, but it's about 170%. In this program, the assumption has been that until 2020, this ratio will be below 120%. In the year since this program, this memorandum of understanding had been agreed, the numbers of Greece had been ahead of the program, far ahead of the program. Growth has developed faster than expected. Reducing deficit has de fast developed faster than expected. They got earlier primary surplus than expected. Therefore, Greece has been on a very promising way. Then they have uh, campaigned. It's a sovereign decisive decision of Greek people, as you can imagine. And then so now we have a new government, and they want to, to change this. And we said, OK, that's you. You are the democratic elected government, with also respect. But um, uh, tell us how you, how you imagine, how you can get, in some day, access to financial markets. Maybe you will ask Mr. Varoufakis. But uh, once again, what I have already said, if he want to tell you, it's in this years, and I, I don't know but now he's, uh, whether, how long he will serve as finance minister. Let's say he will serve the next six years. In this six years, uh, his most problem will be not, not debt restructuring, because the Greece debt is, for a long time, very modest finance. Therefore, debt restructuring may be a, a, a problem in future decades. Today, the Greek government has totally different uh, challenges, huge challenges. I would never change my job with him. I'm quite happy. I will not have a much better position, much more comfortable, very far. But if, as long as he, they are telling the problem is debt restructuring, today, no, the problem is today, is that they have to move in a way that Greek economy is becoming a little bit more effective, that Greek economy can deliver increasing part of what Greek people want to enjoy. And you have to know, it may be you can ask how he will explain that the minimum wage in Greece by law is still higher than in some, in, in some member states of the Eurozone. That the ratio of people occupied in administration is still, <coughs> before this government has uh, uh, hired again the people who have been uh, reduced uh, in the last couple of years. The ratio of people occupied in public administration is higher than, I think, in every other, other member state of the Eurozone. And that is difficult to become a, a competitive economy, not to mention the very difficult challenge to build up institutional framework in Greece. What is not, in, what is not to be criticized this government, by far not to. All these problems are inherited from former times, by sure. But that are the real challenges of Greece, and not to blame the Europeans, not to, be, not to understand how economy works. Even Yanis Varoufakis, who is a famous economist, is not the, one, the first economist in world history. Not. <laughs> Fiona. Thank you very much, Fiona Hill from the Brookings Institution. Um, obviously, most of the questions and your presentation has been about Europe and the Eurozone, and, but you're here against the backdrop of global meetings uh, for the IMF. And I'm wondering if you might make some observations about Germany and Europe as a global economic player. We've just had this rather unfortunate apparent rift between the United States and many of its European partners on the new Asian Investment and Development Bank set up by China. You mentioned the UK um, uh, just a, a few moments ago. The UK and other European uh, countries have been very quick uh, to join in uh, with this institution. And there's a lot of questions now about the implications of this. And I just wonder if you could give us some of your observations and thoughts on this general set of issues. Thank you. I think, of course, we European in, in, in have always in, in, in uh, the IMF meetings uh, to explain what we are doing in Europe. 
and I think uh, the, the Chinese has to explain what they are doing in China. Everyone prefers to explain what others should do, <coughs> but it's better to explain what you are doing. It's more difficult because you, therefore we are speaking, of course, of what we are doing in, in, in Europe. I am strongly in, in favor, and German government is strongly in favor, that we uh, strengthen our Atlantic partnership with well, and uh, therefore we, we are very much in favor even uh, to use the uh, T7 uh, 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 umbrella and, and instrument and, and, and so to, to make it efficient. In this very specific case of the AAAB, uh, uh, this Chinese, uh, I would say, I would first to Mike on by side, we all would be very happy if it would be possible someday to convince U.S. Congress to implement quota reform of IMF. It's always very difficult, and we always try not to blame, not to blame U.S., but it makes things difficult because you can't lead economically and politically this globalized world only by, to quote Joseph Nye, Soft, uh, hard power. You need soft power, and soft power needs reciprocity in some, in some regard. I could mention a lot of, as a, as a strong pro-Europe, pro-Atlantic uh, uh, man, uh, as uh, Steve Talbot had uh, so rightly mentioned, I could give you a lot of examples, uh, very concrete examples. So, then this AIB is a, is a problem. I would have been much in favor to have a common position of all G7. We didn't uh, achieve it, but what we managed to do is we did it in a close context. We had a lot of, I arranged because actually I'm the president of the G7 finance minister, we have a lot of very concrete and open uh, discussions uh, how we can manage that some of the G7 is joined. UK is always leading in Europe in any regard of European integration, therefore they went ahead. <laughs> <laughs> France, Italy, Germany have decided uh, together. Uh, now we have we have a common position for negotiations on, on the governance and on the conditions and all this. But we also communicate, and we will do it even by, by the occasion of this meeting uh, today and tomorrow, um, to not only discuss under this G7 members which have decided to join, but also with our American most best friends and most important partners, and also with Japan and, and, and Canada. We will try to have common position as well with Australia and so on to make, to avoid that this issue will uh, cause any additional problems in the transatlantic relations because we have had too much problems. Not, none of this problem has been needed. I didn't, I didn't see any necessity for any of this problem. But we had too many problems, and now we are reducing it because uh, we will succeed, we Europeans as well, only on, on, on the basis of a close cooperation. We have common values. If we want to work for our values, and I am totally decided to do it in this global as well, I am quite sure that 80% of these uh, 7 billion people prefer to live in line with democracy, rule of law, social coherence, economic sustainability, all of them. And you can now, all dictators are very nervous. They have much more confidence in the superiority of our values than we all themselves sometimes have. And therefore, we ourselves sometimes have. And therefore, I'm quite optimistic we should work. We have to have this in mind. But what I said in, on, in, on the <laughs> motivation of European people for European integration on, 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 on the uh, uh, question of uh, uh, Mr. Davis. We must never think what we have achieved is granted for future. That is what we have to do. Here, the last question, I think. 
Uh, thank you for the, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman, Minister. Uh, my name is Thanos Dimatis, and I represent uh, Alpha TV Channel Station of Greece. I'm native Greek journalist. Can you uh, hold the mic a little closer? Yeah, I'm from Alpha TV Channel Station of Greece. My name is Thanos Dimatis. I have two questions for you, Mr. Minister. You know that, accordingly to several Greek media and international media reports. Uh, a lot of the members of the Greek government, especially in the pre-electoral pre process, have been have demonized you as representative of a German policy that, accordingly to their views, uh, you try to impose in Greece austerity measures. How do you perceive that? What is your reaction on these uh, arguments? And also, I think that the Greek people needs a clear answer from you about the potential Brexit. Do you think that it is something which is on the table if Greek government and lenders that does not reach any agreement until June 30? Thank you very much. Look, if you, are, if you want to, to stay in politics, and I do it by enthusiasm for a long time already, you have to know you will be criticized. That is, if you don't like if you don't stand by the heat, you must not stay in the kitchen. That is quite clear. <laughs> by the way, it's not a privilege of Greece that medias make a, write a lot of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a privilege of Greece. I have, uh, I, you can, if you, there are protocols of uh, uh, meetings of the firm, federal parliament in Germany. You can, you can uh, as a journalist, you can read all these things. What I have said since 2000, on Greece. I have always said in any speech, please, please, my fellow countrymen, don't ma make Greek bashing. People in Greek suffer much more than most people in Germany. And we have to be, and, and we should be, I, I could tell you even in German media there have been some, I wouldn't uh, be pleased. I have not been pleased as German political, and I wouldn't be pleased as a Greek citizen. I am not a Greek citizen. Therefore, I don't, by the way, I have not learned Greek language. Therefore, I can't read Greek newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, 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 look, I'm 27, uh, 72 years old. I will not learn <laughs> language. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> Having said this, uh, I have a, a, a personal good relation with Yanofakis. Uh, I have never, uh, be, and uh, even he did never make a, a personal offend to me, not at all. And I don't, I know we have different political opinions, by sure. But uh, I have a lot of people in, in Germany, even good friends, which have very different, different political opinions. It's a different issue, so forth. I think, um, and I know in, in campaigning, Political parties, political leaders, including myself, tend to say things, if they will be asked later on, they would say, oh, mm -hmm. I didn't say this really, and I didn't. Oh, oh, oh. So, no. Of course, um, therefore, I, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not personally in, in, in any regard related. Of course, sometimes you think, hmm, Okay, and the, re the sto real story is, I will tell you a secret thing. In the last couple of years, not only in my own party, I was for a long time seen as a very dangerous man who will be too generous in, in, in spending too much money of Germany for, for other people, no, not to be them. And I have often been recommended by people from the IMF that I should be have in mind as soon as I have uh, a friendly uh, discussion with a Greek colleague, it will be misunderstood that Germany will not support. Uh, so that's that's a normal political, but it doesn't change anything and the and the, and the problems in substance. Uh, and once again. To be very, I have to be very careful because always the media tend to make any news. There is no news on, on the situation in Greece. Greece uh, 
if Greece wants to get more money, and in the given program, you may know the Greek Prime Minister said we don't want we don't want another program. It's fine. Nobody will ask Greek to take a program. <coughs> it's different. It's different uh, the situation. I know. If we will continue to have negative interest rates, banks will uh, will have to advertise, "Who take my money? I will pay something for if you take my money." That is not the case with Greece. <laughs> we don't want that everyone ask for our money. But if Greek want to get the disbursement of the pending transfers, what is 1.8, 1.9 billion in the given program, Greece has to uh, f fulfill to deliver what has been agreed. If not, it's fine. Then it's up to Greek to decide what is going to happen. We don't, of course, if, if my Greek colleague would ask my, my opinion, my advice, I would give, but not publicly, not in, in this firm. No, not at all. Therefore, it's the decision of the Greek government and the elected parliament with all the respect to decide what will happen. And therefore, you have to ask uh, Yanis Varoufakis what will happen, not me. But the, Please. About the exit from the euro, Should, what, what's your message to the Greek people on that question? It's only a decision of Greece. Thank you. Okay, uh, our time is up. If I can ask you all, please, to stay in your seats while the, so the minister can leave. Uh, we'd appreciate that. Uh, as you know, we have a quick turnaround time to uh, Yanis Varoufakis. So if you got one of those little red stickers, you have, you have a seat for the Varoufakis thing, I would recommend you keep it. If you don't, you're supposed to leave, and Kamal will personally escort you out if you stay in the seat. Uh, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the minister for his time.